uh, to our, this is actually our first full session of adult faith formation, this, uh, this academic year or this semester, as I like to think in terms of semesters. Today we're going to be covering a topic that is significant not only in our local history, but is very significant in our Catholic history. And um, that is, of course, the 1873 yellow fever epidemic that is actually the subject of a book being written right now by Ryan Smith, um, Father Peter, and myself, uh, something that you're going to be hearing a lot about this fall as we mark this very significant anniversary. This is actually the 145th anniversary of uh, the yellow fever outbreak in Shreveport in 1873, and today, today marks the 145th anniversary of the death of Father Jean-Pierre who was the founding pastor of Holy Trinity. Um, the, is, are, am, are we rolling? No. Okay. The, um, yesterday was the 145th anniversary of the death of Father Isidore Camaray, who was the associate pastor. And that sort of begins, uh, begins sort of the, the, the marking of the deaths, if you will, at least in terms of, of what we're going to be looking at today. So if I were to, someone were to ask me what was the most significant or most transformative event in all of Shreveport history, uh, in our almost, now almost 200 year history, what would be that single event? And it is 1873, and it comes in the form of a virus, yellow fever. That is the single most transformative event in our entire history as a city is 1873, for reasons we're going to talk just a little bit about today. Yellow fever is um, an illness that we're going to be talking a lot about in terms of, of where it comes from, how it's transmitted. I'm going to leave all of the gore and, and, and bloody details to Ryan to tell you about. Um, but it, um, it has been called the American plague by more than one uh, historian has used that term, the American plague. And I think plague is, is more than an appropriate word for what we're going to be talking about. You know, when we think about plague, we think about, we conjure images of epidemiological disaster, social instability, social chaos, the entire breakdown, really, of, of the social order in some cases. I mean, think biblically, for instance, about plague. And think about that. There are many notable examples of plagues in history, uh, perhaps the most famous being the mid-14th century outbreak of bubonic plague in Europe that swept through and claimed between one-third and one-half of the population within a decade. That's a pretty dramatic uh, force that would destabilize the society. And then, of course, the most devastating plague in history, and I feel like I'm getting echo here for yeah, some reason. I'm not sure why. Some place I stand, I guess. Um, the most devastating plague was, of course, the 1972 Spanish influenza pandemic, where you have millions of people that are killed around the world uh, during that pandemic. But Shreveport in 1873 is certainly a model, uh, perhaps not on that scale, but for the local population, the scale was significant. And it also means the same kind of breakdown of social order and destabilization that you see with, it, with all the ones I just mentioned, just on a very localized, localized level. And I think that this, is, this means it is a time that really tried the city for two reasons. Uh, one of them was very practical, a very practical sort of uh, trial, if you will. The other one is more philosophical. And I think we're going to look just a little bit at both of those. First of all, the, from the practical aspect, the question in 1873 was, was the city going to survive? Could it survive the economic downturn, the economic disaster, really, that was brought by having the port of the city closed to commerce? All business shut down because we were under federal quarantine. Um, that was a major question. At a time when between August and November of 1873, we lost between, um, well, the estimate is approximately one quarter of our population. So if you think about that in terms of between late August, uh, August 20th is when we, we note the first deaths, through mid-November, or November 18th or so, uh, we're talking about uh, one quarter of the population lost, and that is considering that we believe that one third of the population may have fled in advance of the quarantine. Uh, so we're talking about large numbers, and in this case, if you wanted to do something on a comparative scale today, we would be talking about 50,000 people dead 
within a matter of weeks in our local community. So if that gives you some perspective of the scale that we're talking about, um, that, that should help. So this was obviously not the first time yellow fever had visited Shreveport. Um, for reasons we're going to talk about, Shreveport was always sort of a prime place for, for yellow fever to come visit. Uh, some of you know, and I know that you're following this, but the History Department at LSU Shreveport right now is working on a project to locate the burial site of William Bennett, who really was our city's founder, uh, the, the original founder of the Shreveport Company. He was here before Captain Henry Miller Shreve in the early 1830s, and uh, he died in 1837 of yellow fever. So there was another major epidemic that hit here in 1853. Uh, it's the same one that hit, of course, New Orleans and Memphis and St. Louis that year. But 1873 in Shreveport is no doubt the worst. As a matter of fact, it is recorded in United States history as the third worst in Shreveport in 1873. Uh, we are beat out only by Memphis, excuse me, only by New Orleans and St. Louis in 1853. So, um, and when I'm used the word plague, I know, I know that that's a, kind of a terrifying word to us to use the American plague, but, um, but I do think that it's appropriate for what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, the, the scale of this at, at the local level was really, really unprecedented. Okay. So that brings me to the second question. You know, I mentioned that the first one is practical. Would, the Shreveport, would Shreveport survive as a city after that economic disaster of being closed to commerce and all business shut down? Would we survive? Well, the second question I have really related to that is more philosophical. I think it's a question that we all have uh, when we are faced with something of this scale, a human crisis of this kind of scale, as people of faith, it's probably a very pointed question for us, how do we respond in times like this? Not just as a city, but how do we respond individually when we're confront confronted with this kind of human crisis? And I think the secondary question that we all ask is why do such horrible things happen in the first place? Why do things like this happen? A biography of... Um, of uh, my good friend and a doctor of the church, St. Teresa of Avila, um, addresses this uh, almost directly. It is, it is a drawn from a long-standing oral tradition in the Carmelite order. Uh, there's a story about St. Teresa that supposedly she'd witnessed uh, a major tragedy of a flood that claimed the lives of many, many people. And that she, uh, in her prayer time, asked God why he would permit something so horrific to happen to his people. And she says, reported to her sisters, that God responded to her in her prayer time that it happened because he loves his people. And she retorted with a candor that, and honesty that I have really come to appreciate about her. You may have heard this quote of hers. She responded by saying, well, God, if this is how you treat your friends, it's no wonder you have so few of them. <laughs> because she struggled to understand, and again, I think we all do, about why a loving and merciful God would let something uh, like this happen in the first place. So I want to get dispensed with that um, because it is a deep philosophical question that Shreveport would have been asking in 1873. Uh, so I think in that regard, St. Teresa speaks across the centuries to all of us. But um, the Catechism of the Catholic Church gives us some wisdom about this. It, in, in the discussion of the fall, uh, the Catechism tells us that the, the truth of humankind is real. The truth of our condition is real. We live in a broken world. And because of the fall, um, that, that this world is in fact broken and we will experience all sorts of tragedies and disasters, that God did not create death. God did not make death. He does not take delight in it. But it is the condition of humanity because of the fall. So there's no question that death was the word between August and November of 1873. So how we're going to do this this morning is we're going to break this out into three portions. Uh, I am going to be uh, here up first, obviously. I'm going to be looking at early Shreveport history to provide some context for this disaster, to get the full context to, um, to the planting of this weird little river city, why, we are even, why we're even here. Uh, that sort of helps us explore the context for yellow fever, why it hit Shreveport so frequently and so with such ferocity in 1873. I'm not gonna be explaining yellow fever too much from an incredibly scientific position, but I'll tell you what I know about its origins, its reservoir, how it is transmitted, 
and why it affected Shreveport the way it did in 1873. Then, Ryan um, is going to, to give uh, some background on uh, the men we, and, and women that we really want to highlight today, uh, the heroes, martyrs of our own hometown, uh, 1873. I hope that all of you notice that you have in front of you uh, prayer cards for each of the five priests. Do you all see those? Okay, those are for you to take. And then Father Peter is going to conclude with some further uh, thoughts and reflections as well about what we hope to accomplish uh, through doing this. So the fact that Shreveport ever existed at all, and I'm going to start with some really beautiful images of the river. These are 1872. Uh, we have these in our archives at LSU Shreveport, and it's an opportunity for me to show these off because they really are works of art, aren't they? Um, 1872, so we're talking about the year before the epidemic. Um, but use that as an opportunity, sort of a background, to talk about why Shreveport even existed. Our existence is rooted in a very weird, unique little geography, because when you think about it, Louisiana is the first state that was carved out of the, uh, out of the Louisiana Purchase. And the reason for that was, of course, that President Jefferson and his successors had hoped to, uh, to control the port of New Orleans and the Mississippi River. So the qu next question became then uh, how to... Uh, engage in direct commerce with the independent republic of texas which was to our west and remember that texas was an independent republic didn't enter the federal union until 1845 so at the time of our founding that's the whole reason we existed was to be this conduit of commerce to, goods could be could be brought through the port of new orleans uh, brought the atchafalaya put on the red and then offloaded in shreveport and transported into the independent country of texas so that's the whole reason we're here. But of course, in order for that to happen, this 160 mile long log jam, and this is actually, again, not an 1830s photograph, okay? No, 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 this is 1872. But you can see in 1872, uh, only about 30% of the river by 1872 was navigable, which is the reason the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers had to come back in here. But the whole point being that our existence, I'm going the wrong way here, our existence was, was rooted in this need to, to, uh, to grow commerce. And that was our entire reason for existence, the whole reason we came into existence. So the northern part of the state, Shreveport, was settled with this singular purpose in mind. It's the whole reason we're here. It's the reason if you go downtown, you notice that in our central business district, the streets are named for heroes of the Texas Republic. We've always identified much more with Texas than we did with the state of Louisiana, and that's why because of the Texas Trail. We're the furthest point west in the United States in 1839, and I don't think people maybe realize that. In the United States, in the incorporated United States, it's Shreveport that is the furthest point on the western frontier. Think about that, right? Which be a subject for a whole other talk. But, um, so, Captain Henry Miller Shreve, of course, was able to clear this log jam with the warning that it would come back, and of course it did, as you're looking at these 1872 photographs. Right, right there. Shreveport's original boundaries were contained within a parcel of land that was sold to the Shrevetown Company uh, by the Caddo Indians in 1835, and by 1839, Shreveport was incorporated. And the rest, as they say, is history. So our original business district is what you see today. It's 64 square blocks. We have eight streets that run west, west from the Red River. We have uh, eight streets that run south from Cross Bayou, which is a tributary of the Red. And it very looks very much, of course, like this today. And as a matter of fact, if you look at 1872 photographs, there's much about the riverfront that you would, you would in fact recognize. The city absolutely boomed with commerce. This place was happening. Now, this is an 1890s photograph of Commerce Street. So it's a little bit beyond our purview here. But again, provide you some important context for understanding what the epidemic is going to do to Shreveport economically. This is the 1890s. Shreveport has rebounded, obviously. You might recognize one or two of those buildings on Commerce Street that are still standing there, um, old warehouses and markets. And the city then began to expand beyond that central business district, that 64 square blocks, uh, way south, like way south to Durham Street. Uh, by the turn of the 20th century, we had, we had gone that far uh, and further, of course, uh, northward as well. So we were a southern city. We were also this frontier city. Uh, but we were, uh, I cannot stress to you enough, 
that this place was on the growth like nobody's business. And, and I, I think I can demonstrate that to you uh, right here. So if you look at the population of Shreveport, um, and, and we start with a few hundred people in 1840. There's a few hundred people here in 1840. So in between 1860 and 1900, this city suffered uh, really from two major, perhaps three major events. First of all, of course, Shreveport was a target during the Civil War. You might remember that in April of 1864, there were um, two battles fought south of here to stop the Union advance into Texas. That's one thing, of course. We were, the, we were the last sort of Confederate capital, if you will, right here. The other thing is that Reconstruction uh, was, we were federally occup occupied by federal troops in 1872 as part of military Reconstruction. And then the third thing, of course, is in 1873, the yellow fever epidemic. So you would expect to see maybe some population um, decline. You would expect to see it impacted negatively. But that's not what you see at all. Look at this. In 1860, 3,500, 4,500 people living here in 1870, 8,000 in 1880. So we almost doubled between 1870 and 1880, even after we lost one quarter of our population. What's going on? People are coming here because the city has rebounded and it's booming economically. And of course, by 1900, we doubled the population from 1880. And this trajectory just continues into the middle to the latter part of the 20th century when it begins to reverse itself. Uh, and I think we're down to about, what, 16,000 now? No, let's see. Um, but but my, my point is that this is the economic condition of Shreveport in 1873. It was healthy, it was vital, it was dynamic. Uh, there was so much going on here uh, that, that the, point, the point being that there's obviously still much going on after the epidemic that people would come back and want to live here. Okay, so I mentioned federal reconstruction. Uh, federal reconstruction is going to stop very abruptly in 1873, came to a screeching halt because of the outbreak of yellow fever. And of course, the economic boom in Shreveport is also going to come to a screeching halt in 1873 as well. So yellow fever, also called yellow jack colloquially, is a mosquito-borne illness. Its evolutionary origins are in Africa. It's transmitted from apes to humans, apes being the primary reservoir for the virus. Uh, it was brought to the New World, we believe, probably by the slave trade, most likely at the end of the 17th century. So a lot of times when you read histories of yellow fever, you come across references to old world and new world. So before, before colonization and, and after colonization. Uh, there is something that sounds like a yellow fever epidemic that broke out in the Caribbean in Barbados in 1647. It's recorded in the primary source. Uh, and it's interesting the way that this is, the, the writer of this chronicle distinguishes it from another mosquito-borne illness <clears throat> by pointing out a very dramatic symptom that he noticed. That there is jaundice. The victim, he says, is yellow. All right? <coughs> now, yellow fever is not used, that name is not used until the 18th century to describe this illness but clearly it indicates um, the recognition that the virus, uh, the assault of the virus on the liver causes jaundice and gives, it gives the, the victim this signature uh, yellow look. And this is the name that stuck, yellow fever, yellow jack uh, stuff. There are some other New World chronicles that refer to something uh, called the bleeding sickness or the black vomit, which Ryan's gonna talk a lot more about, but um, also, not using the term yellow fever, but using a symptom that we recognize as being synonymous with yellow fever. So we assume that that's what is, is being described. It is important, I think, a lot of people maybe don't realize this. This <coughs> virus is not transmitted person to person. It's not transmitted by direct human contact. Um, as I mentioned, apes are the primary reservoir of this virus. Uh, they are bitten in either rainforest or jungles by non-carrying mosquitoes. The mosquito becomes infected and then, of the carrier, and then the mosquito, of course, bites a human, a different, another human, and the human becomes infected, and the cycle continues. So that the infected human is then bitten, perhaps, by a non-carrying mosquito, who then takes it to another human being. My point being that this is not, again, not, not person to person contagious. It requires that third vector of the mosquito. So, Obviously, in the 19th century, no one knew this yet. No one knew uh, very little, actually, about this particular um, 
disease. It's why it spreads so rapidly in the summer or late summer, early fall, in cities, urban conditions where you have dense populations of people and often transient populations of people, like, I don't know, in a river port where you have lots of commerce coming in and out, uh, transient populations, and also the other thing, of course, we have uh, in, in our city, as it does New Orleans and Memphis and St. Louis, is a really large mosquito population in the summer, which is the other thing, of course, that's necessary. So the 1873 epidemic began uh, actually in New Orleans. Um, it began aboard a Spanish ship, the Valparaiso. Uh, the first mate uh, died of yellow fever in June, uh, early, like June 26th, um, 1873, it was the first case. And then of course, by August, Shreveport is seeing yellow fever as well. Urban yellow fever, it's not hard to see why it would spread this way. If you have uh, Africa as a point of origin and then you have ships that come that are bringing commerce and goods into the Indies, in this case, the Valparaiso was leaving Cuba and coming to, uh, to New Orleans. The, uh, the first mate had already been infected, probably, in Cuba. Uh, by the time they, they reached the port of New Orleans, he's nearly dead. So this is how it's introduced into heavy, heavily populated areas like river ports that have all the exact right conditions, the transient population, the density of population, and the, the density of the mosquito population being another, uh, another issue. Because nobody understood how the, the disease is transmitted, however, it led to almost um, immediately upon recognizing what the illness was, there were federal quarantines. An area would be quarantined to stop the spread of the disease, and Shreveport was no exception, although we were very slow to recognize it. No, 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 no. We were very slow to admit that it was yellow fever. Uh, in the beginning, because of course what it would mean is the shutting down of all commerce. But uh, it led, of course, to that response of shutting everything down to contain the illness. And of course, the, the, the problem with that is that mosquitoes don't obey quarantines. And the, and the other problem with that is, and certainly in the case of Shreveport in 1873, 1873 many people didn't obey the quarantine either. So it, it spread beyond Shreveport, notwithstanding the, um, the federal quarantine. It was not until you have the pioneering work that's done by Dr. Walter Reed in 1900 that identifies yellow fever and malaria as being mosquito-borne illnesses. So the work begins to develop a vaccine. By the 1950s, there is one, and today, um, there are very few cases of yellow fever reported in the world. As a matter of fact, last year the World Health Organization reported a little over 100 cases in West Africa. Uh, there were a few in China last year. But even today, uh, if you contracted yellow fever, the mortality rate is about 5%. Because with hospital care, supported medicine, uh, the, the mortality rate is quite low today. But in Shreveport in 1873, the mortality rate was between 80 and 90 percent, uh, that particular outbreak. So there were people who survived, of course. I mentioned 80, 80 to 90 percent survival. I mean, mortality rate, that means that we've got a survival rate of about 10 percent. And those people left some incredible chronicles that, um, that give us some insight into the suffering of this city and the contributions of some of our notable citizens we'll be talking about. All right, so no one knew, as I said, no one really knew this was mosquito born. Uh, but the first indication that something was wrong, this is actually a little snapshot taken from the front page of the Shreveport Times, Daily Shreveport Times, as it was called, on August 20th of 1873. Uh, there is a report that three men have died. One man dropped dead on Texas Street, it says. Uh, but no one is calling it anything, right? It's not, it, it's not even, even mentioned what the cause might be. This is August 20th. Um, not a single person, as I said, thought in the beginning that this was yellow fever. Or if they did, they're going to be reluctant to call it that. But there was one person 
who visited Shreveport, a University of Kentucky medical student who, who visited here uh, during the epidemic and left us a beautiful map, actually. Uh, Augustin Booth, who was a medical student at the University of Kentucky, drew this map. And you can see that he's drawn all of downtown, right? Y'all got that? All of downtown. He's got the river. There's a, there's a legend that you probably can't see over here, but one of the things that he notes, he notes where the lowlands are, where the swampy areas are. He also notices, um, or, or makes a point of, noting stagnant pool. Do you see that? Can y'all see that over here? Stagnant pool. So to zoom in on this, he notes one of these, especially at the corner of Spring Street and Texas Streets. He notes that there's a large pool of stagnant water. Well, why would he note that? Is he onto something? Is he just trying to figure out what that might have to do with the public health condition? Probably. Um, but, but definitely, we, we, we sort of see a turn, at least in medicine, to really try to figure out what this is and what the cause might be. So, uh, on the night of September 1st, 1873, physicians in this city held a meeting to discuss the crisis. Uh, this meeting uh, took place um, at St. Mark's Episcopal Church, which, not where you think of it today, this is the Church of the Holy Cross, which is the original St. Mark's, down on Cotton Street. And Reverend Doctor, his medical doctor, William Dalzell, stood in the pulpit and he told everyone assembled, this is yellow fever. I've seen it before, I know what it is. Uh, we've got to respond to this now. And he basically told people to flee for their lives. Well, not very good advice in one way because people who were already infected, of course, took it outside of the city of Shreveport. Uh, and uh, but leading, he, he's the one that led the charge on this, to make the city recognize and call it what it was, even knowing the consequence would be shutting down all business and all commerce. Um, the following day, September 2nd of 1873, the Shreveport Times has got a little bit different tune, okay? This again from the front page of, the, of, the, of that issue, September 2nd, 1873. The Shreveport Times calls it yellow fever, talks about the meeting, right? That the meeting took place of nearly all the members of the medical profession after a protracted discussion, which is actually not true, probably, because we sort of have the sense that Dr. Dalzell stood up and just said, look, this is what it is. But look at the bottom here, what it says. The opinion of the meeting, that yellow fever does exist, but not as an epidemic. Well, maybe not yet. <laughs> Um, the outbreak killed as many as 30 people a day at its peak, and actually we are in the week, the 145th anniversary of the peak of this epidemic. I mentioned today is the anniversary of the death of Father Jean-Pierre, September 16th, 1873. The highest mortality rate was among the young, 20 to 30 year olds, uh, was the highest mortality rate. There's no respecter of that. Uh, there were literally too many people to bury. The city couldn't keep up. So the decision was made, it's recorded in the um, um, early September, I want to say September 8th perhaps, there is a, uh, a, a note in the city council records that, um, that the city had decided to open up a massive trench in Oakland Cemetery for the, for the purpose of creating a mass grave for the victims of this epidemic. The city's exons in the cemetery couldn't keep up with the burials. So these people were buried without ceremony, they were buried without caskets, and that grave today, of course, contains uh, over 800, the remains of over 800 people. Although the marker will tell you 759, I know it's over 800, I know that. Trust me, I know that. So, on that poignant note, before I, before I hand this over to, um, to Ryan, um, this past week, it's really remarkable how since we've been working on this project, uh, the, the Providence has been, it, just, I don't know, incredible. Um, I went yesterday to, to the museum downtown that, that we supervise, uh, the depository sort of all the artifacts of Shreveport history. This is Spring Street Museum, I'm located right next to that stagnant pool of water. Um, but, uh, well, it is a spring after all. I call it Spring Street for a reason. But um, anyway, I went down there to look for something in a city directory from the 1870s and the curator there said, oh, by the way, you're not going to believe what I found this week. 
He said, I was back in the archives and he said, I pulled out a wall, they were doing some repair work in the basement. And he said, I pulled out a wall and there's a box in there from the 1870s that I've never seen before. <laughs> and this is a note <coughs> written, it's a record that's on Shreveport 1873 stationery, a handwritten note that records the death of three siblings, one seven-year-old, one five-year-old, and one seven-month-old. And whoever wrote this also sort of drew a line here and said, um, both died the same day and they're buried together in one grave, died of yellow fever. So we assume that they're probably in the mound uh, at, at Oakland Cemetery. But this is the sort of stuff, this, um, as Brian called it, the ephemera, this is the stuff that, that gives us that tangible connection uh, to this. So um, he had already entered this into the collection, and, and it was, had already been put in the accession record and on display, and I removed it yesterday from the display. I checked it out, if you will, and I brought it, if you want to come look at it, it's right up here. Uh, if you want to take a look at an original sort of note from 1873. All right, so I think what I'll do is, is hand it over to Ryan, uh, but before I do that, uh, to tell you sort of the, the immediate setup for him is that in Shreveport, uh, most of the city's doctors and nurses were dead within two weeks, which means that there are other people who are going to have to step into the role of caretaker. There were many people who fled the city, who chose not to stay. There were people who took advantage of the situation to loot stores downtown to vandalize, to violate the curfew, break the quarantine, uh, take advantage of, of a crisis like that, while there were other people who were making the choice not only to stay, but to care for the sick and the dying. And what's more remarkable is the people who were making the decision to come, to come to Shreveport. So um, I'm gonna take a little bit of a break so I can hand off the mic to Ryan. In the meantime, I'm gonna show you our little video that we did again, which is a great little setup for him and then he will be ready to go with talking about um, our priest. Is that right, Ryan? Okay. All right, good morning. Good yeah. morning. Y'all hear me okay? All right. Um, so I'm going to begin with that, uh, with that great setup to the story of these uh, five men, these five clergymen, um, who I hope at the end of today and perhaps in the next year or so you will come to know very well. Um, let's go ahead and look at it sort of as a cast of characters. It's, it's, a, it's a remarkable story, a remarkable narrative. We'll begin with uh, Father Isidore Camray, um, native of Brittany, France. Uh, assistant pastor of Holy Trinity in his 20s. Uh, came over age of 25. He's here not very long. Uh, comes through New Orleans and South Louisiana, is assigned to the frontier, essentially uh, to, the, to the sticks, to the hills of North Louisiana, to back up Father Pierre, who's been building uh, quite, uh, quite a parish here in Shreveport, beginning in the 1850s. So Father Kemre uh, accompanies his pastor to a uh, board of trade building meeting on September 2nd at 10 a.m. And this is where, uh, in absence of a, of a properly functioning government, you have to remember we're in Reconstruction. We're in the grips of Reconstruction right now. We have a, a government uh, that is backed by the federal government. And um, you have your former citizens, uh, many of whom just rebelled from the Union not too many years ago. <laughs> And there's a, a definite disconnect, and you can see that in the correspondence of the day, in the newspapers of the day, between the people, the government, what's going on, what isn't going on. And so this, this 10 a.m. meeting on September 2nd is a lot of the prominent citizens coming together and saying, well, we can't stand by any longer and just watch people die without doing something. So um, the only two Catholic priests in town joined those 16 men total. So 14 others on September 2nd, 10 a.m. And uh, begin to plan what to do to help ease the suffering of the yellow fever ep epidemic in Shreveport. So I know there are some physicians in the room. There's, uh, there's probably some nurses. There's definitely some healthcare people in the room. 
I don't, we don't have much because Father Kimre died first. We don't have much account of his time, his service here. So what I'd like to do now is to give you uh, a glimpse of the death at the hands of yellow fever and do it in a way that doesn't really tell you our modern understanding of what the disease is, but what the Victorian eyes saw and what they thought it was. To, because I think that helps understand our martyrs' sacrifice because they didn't know it was mosquito-borne and they thought that contact with the sick and dying would lead to your own death. That gives you a better understanding of the psychology of the, of the mindset of these men going in to, to help the suffering. So here's what it's like to die from yellow fever in Shreveport in particular in 1873. So I, I took accounts contemporary to that time that particular strand, that particular veracity of the virus, uh, and what was commonly reported at that time. So as the illness takes hold, the patient becomes depressed. They become tired. They just want to lay down. And in this case, you have to think about Shreveport, everyone who's not sick already is busily helping their sick and dying family members. So they're already tired. So just because someone becomes tired at the end of their day, while they've been nursing their sister or their wife or their husband, doesn't automatically trigger, oh gosh, I've got the yellow fever now. They just think they're sick. So they lay down. Uh, the, the sort of lassitude becomes kind of a sense of doom. A sense of doom is reported frequently with um, the yellow fever patients in, in Shreveport, impending doom. Following that bout of malaise, um, the fever, the virus here presented as a slight chill, a slight chilly sensation, uh, sort of a tingle. Um, that could shift suddenly into dramatic shakes, at least in Shreveport. That's how it presented. Um, next was commonly recorded an intense headache, accompanying with pain in the back and the limbs. Um, about this time, the person was in so much pain that their body began to vomit, they began to retch. It's sort of a reaction to that sort of intense pain. Uh, as the fever set in, um, the, the body's temperature rose extremely fast. Uh, once uh, the pain had reached intolerable levels, those looking into the eyes of a Shreveport yellow fever patient would observe them to be swollen, yellow. Uh, they would be dry to the touch, and yes, they would touch their eyes to, to track, to mark the progress of the disease. Um, they would appear, in the terms of one Shreveport physician, as conveying the impression that the eye socket was just too small. So they began to bulge out of their heads. Um, the gaping and, and probably unseeing eyes, I would assume at this point they weren't seeing, I don't know. Uh, they would have poured out water secretions that would have had to been constantly wiped away. The patient's pulse would be racing. Their tongue would swell. And if they tried to communicate with those around them, it, it would appear that their tongue was just sort of bouncing around and they weren't getting words out. The skin would have been hot and dry. The actual fever phase of the illness lasted about 72 hours on average here. But in some cases, um, if they were already sick or feeble already, uh, you know, they would mercifully die much more quickly. Others ling ling lingered far longer, including one of our priests, Father Lebier. He uh, lingered for more than a week. Um, it just depends, case to case. Um, this lingering phase gave some a sense of false hope. You see that a lot in, um, in first-person accounts from the Shreveport epidemic where such so-and-so is, is doing much better today. You know, we, expect a, we expect a recovery and then two days later they're, they're, they're dead. So that's a very common story. Um, following the fever, the body transitioned into this calm stage is what they refer to it as the calm stage. In the usual, usual course of the virus, that is, believe it or not, most people did survive. Um, at least a little bit more than half survived who contracted it. Um, this would signal uh, your body was on the mend. And uh, in the minds of the Victorian physician, what happened next following the calm stage, the calm stage determined who would live and who would die. So uh, the pulse slowed, the skin became cool to the touch, and the patient may 
have regained their senses for a time. If their body had defeated the virus, they would begin to show signs of cognition and restlessness at the thought of laying on their would-be deathbed. That's recorded a lot. Like, I got to get up. I'm tired of laying here. Um, I survived. I got to get moving. Um, if not, if they were truly dying, at the end of this calm stage, the patient then began to vomit their own blood. This is the term black vomit. Um, I guess when the blood comes out that way, it's more black than red at that point. I don't know. This is not something I've witnessed myself, thank God. Their temperature would spike again, and their body would return to convulsions and involuntary retching. So uh, if the patient, and this is recorded in the medical journals of the day, there was a, uh, a great emphasis on the ability of the body to pass urine during this ordeal. If, if they could continue to pass urine, they were thought that they would probably beat the fever. Um, if they were able to do so, it was probably dark, reddish, noxious, um, full of byproducts. Uh, but most cases, they weren't able to. And that was almost always the telltale sign of death, at least in the minds of those physicians. What did they do to treat it? So during the length of this ordeal, uh, depending on the physician, practices varied, but um, certainly, commonly they would be given calomel or quinine or pulverized Ipecac. And um, some of these would have acted as, as a cathartic or a sedative, uh, sort of to calm the body because of the ordeal that the physicians knew were coming. Very often they were given an enema to evacuate the system so that all organs could rest. Caretakers would then alternate hot and cold compresses as the fever waxed and waned, offering warm, cool liquids to drink, hot tea or cold, cold green tea, orange leaf and sage tea, carbonated water was thought to have a lot of medicinal properties at that time. It was given to the patients and iced lemonade. Patients were given ice to chew on. Uh, ice, believe it or not, was actually readily at hand in Shreveport in 1873. Came on uh, the railroad cars down the river from up north, was stored uh, in warehouses. It was commonly available. Uh, it was emphasized for the patients to retain a composed and relaxed mental status. How they could do that, I cannot imagine. Uh, they would have made to, been made to have lied prone. Most or all of their clothing would have had to have been removed because this was a messy ordeal. And they would have been given sponge baths with vinegar and water or bay rum and water. And mercurous chloride would have been dusted in those bulging eyes for a swift ingestion. Of course, this is, as we recognize today, is a poison. So following that initial meeting, for the next 10 days, Father Kim Ray, Kim Ray, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to, to forward my slides. I won't do that again. Um, worked for 10 days tire, tirelessly, we know from primary accounts, throughout the streets of the city. He was probably assigned to Ward 2. Father Pierre was assigned to Ward 1. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, and that basically is half of Shreveport. So two Catholic priests, you divide the town in half, and you send one to one half and one to the other. It makes the most sense. Um, he was probably unable to attend Sunday Mass on the 14th. And Father Labierre, who is the, um, the pastor at the convent on Fairfield, St. Vincent's, is able to administer him his last sacraments at 7 p.m. September 15th. Um, uh, Father Pierre, his pastor himself, being too sick to do so at that time. So moving to Father Pierre, Father Pierre is quite a figure. Um, he's in his 40s at the time of the epidemic. He's got 20, about 20 years of priesthood behind him. And in that time, since coming also from Brittany, France, he has founded numerous churches, missions. He's founded a girls' convent. He built the first library in Shreveport, um, ordered the books himself, determined how much the fees would be to check out the books, and um, squirreled away all the money from his... Um, uh, tutoring of the elite of the town's children and um, from the library funds to build Holy Trinity Church downtown. The one downtown, of course, is the third version um, and not the one he would have seen with his eyes. He was known as an avid reader, an educator, and a linguist. Um, most importantly, he was known as a man that could get things done, and that's what he did uh, throughout his 20 years. Um, 
it's really quite remarkable and probably out of scope to talk about everything he did uh, for Catholics in North Louisiana, but from ministering in the backwoods to establishing missions for poor and orphans to building a convent, a finishing school for girls, um, which was to become St. Vincent's, to founding our first Catholic church here in town. We owe him, we owe this man a great deal. And interestingly enough, we are looking at the possibility that he was raising an orphan. Um, the details are still being researched. We have this picture from the archive in Alexandria, and on the back, someone has written in that, the hand writing of that period, uh, Father Pierre and the boy he was raising. So um, it appears, and this is an extract from the census, where you see Father Pierre at the top, says Catholic priest, 38 years old, white, from France. And then right below him, you have a 12-year-old male, white male. Looks like J.P. Schnell? 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 He's at school. I don't know. It's also interesting, a Presbyterian minister was living in the same house with these, with these guys and, uh, and his wife. So I don't know at this time if that is what's truly going on, but that appears to be that... Uh, Father Pierre was at least tutoring an orphan to um, keep his eyes towards God, maybe to become the next priest in town. We don't know. We're still looking into that. That is, by the way, Holy Trinity in its first iteration that Father Pierre built basically with his own wages. And you can see he was able to accumulate $4,000, $5,000 worth of wealth, uh, which he later turned into that church. So, the 16 original men, they were called the Howards. The Howards Association was a benevolent society uh, that, that was founded in the early 1800s to combat yellow fever, especially in the American South. And those 16 men that met at that uh, building at 10 a.m. On, on September 2nd in downtown Shreveport founded this, this first branch of the Howards in Shreveport and uh, divided up the workload, so to speak. So here's Ward 1 which you can see is about half the, half the city, maybe a third or a little more. Uh, this is where Father Pierre was. Uh, Camaray, we suspect, was on the other side of Texas Street. Um, no need to put the two priests together when you only have two. So um, that gives you an idea of the scope and the gravity of what they were assigned. Here are some of the men, here are the men who worked alongside Father Pierre, volunteered, to help the sick and dying during the epidemic. L.R. Simmons, he was a 30-year-old future newspaper editor and the president of the Howard Association. R.H. Lindsay, a 39-year-old cotton merchant and immigrant from Scotland. R. Hyams, a 36-year-old druggist from South Carolina. J.W. Booth, I don't think it's John Wilkes Booth, but he's a 53-year-old painter from England. I don't know, could be. Dr. W.S. Donaldson, a medical doctor with yellow fever experience. Otto Schnur, a 17-year-old store clerk, and Tom Bylan, a 40-year-old ship's carpenter from Ohio. So you see, um, first you might notice that no one's born in Shreveport, no one's even born in Louisiana on that list. Uh, it gives you an idea of the sort of town population we had at that time. And um, you see how different uh, the volunteers were that all came together um, to help their fellow citizens. So one of the first, um, records we have from Pierre during the time of the epidemic, keeping in mind he's working from sun up to sun down and beyond, he takes a moment on a Friday to write a prayer in the Shreveport Times, September 5th, and uh, where he asked, um, well, I'll just read it. The undersigned appeals to all of those who believe in the e efficacy of prayer and beseeches them to implore God to have pity on us. And if it is his holy will to deliver us from sickness. Pierre um, begins using his evenings to send messages asking for help. Because he, at this point, it's setting in the gravity of what's at hand. So um, he begins with a prayer, which I think is perfect, right? He's a priest first. And then he asks for material help. He sends a note to the Sisters of Charity in Marshall, Texas... He says, send us all the Sisters of Charity you can spare to our city as soon as possible. All arrangements will be made for them, J. Pierre Priest. 
He then sends a note down, of course, to Fairfield Convent, St. Vincent's. That note doesn't survive. It probably read the same way, asking for the Daughters of the Cross to come assist, who were living there, and uh, Father Lebier, if possible. At this time, uh, Camaray, Father Camaray has, uh, the 26-year-old, his assistant uh, priest, has begun too ill to carry on, and it's pretty clear that he is going to pass. And Father Pierre has begun to feel sick himself. We have some primary accounts of their ministry. Although they died so early, we have less than the rest. Uh, but we know that Father Pierre and Sister Mary Martha, who joined them from the Daughters of the Cross at Fairfield, worked side by side for several days. And here is one of the um, eyewitness accounts that uh, I will share with you. So they, 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 they approach this house who has called for a priest, and um, they knock at the door. The, they can see children and people looking through the windows, and they open the door, and a frantic young father thrusts his um, baby child into the arms of uh, the sister um, there on the porch, Mary Martha, and asks uh, Father Pierre to enter the household and come give last sacraments to his I believe it is his wife, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, we know that, that Father Pierre held her hand and caressed her, her brow, uh, wiping you know, sweat away, and uh, was able to administer her last sacraments. And while doing that, while in that act, the baby died in the arms of the sister out on the porch. Um, that's one of the, the few accounts we have of eyewitness accounts of Pierre's and uh, Sister Mary Martha's service. So the Sunday Mass of September 14th would be Father Pierre's last. Uh, he turned ill and died on Tuesday, September 16th, which brings us to, this is his, um, this is actual, uh, these are scans of, of, that's his image, that's his likeness, and that is uh, a little leaflet from his funeral that uh, we have at hand in the archives at LSUS. Brings us to our next martyr, uh, Father Narcisse Labierre. Uh, he was in his 30s, a native of, uh, and I can't say that. Does anyone know how to say that? St. Brick, Brick, France. Uh, chaplain at St. Vincent the Convent and Academy, and he's only here for about two and a half years before the epidemic. He's, uh, he's a relative of uh, the head sister there, Mother Mary Hyacinth La of the Daughters of the Cross. So Father Bier, Labier is at his post in St. Vincent when the epidemic breaks out. And um, here is the convent and the matron there. And he, um, of course, is fully aware of what's going on. When, by the time his, the note from Father Pierre reaches uh, Father Labier, he is busy taking care of the six sisters. Many of the sisters, the majority of them, are on their own deathbeds, or at least are on their sick beds, and he's already got his plate full, so to speak. Um, he resolves to have mass one more time before he leaves. This was out, this would be at a time when the priest would absolutely have mass every day. Um, but uh, a second note comes, and it basically says, "Look, the priests are are almost dead. You need to come." So he abandons the idea for one more Mass and leaves immediately, uh, leaving the, 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 the sisters that are still able to stand and care for the others to take care for those who are there. A little bit about St. Vincent's girls' school. This would have been a boarding school. So the, the wealthy, the landed, the privileged of, of Shreveport in the, in the environs would have sent their daughters here as like a finishing school. The, the Catholic religious were probably the most educated people here in town along with some of the Episcopal ministers and, so, and some of the uh, educated uh, Jewish population. So um, at that time, this would have been where, you know, whether you were Baptist or whatever, you would have sent your, your daughters here, basically. So not only does he have the sisters on his plate, he has all of these children, these teenage girls, that he has to consider uh, their safety in their lives as well as this epidemic is going on. And by the way, they happen to be from the wealthy and elite of the town, so 
we know that's a, uh, problematic for him. Um, so Lavier Le departs for Shreveport. And, um, excuse me, his first task is to find the priests because he knows they're on their deathbeds. They've been reported to him. And so he does, he's able to administer Camaray's uh, last sacrament and take up the, uh, the cause of continuing the sacraments in Shreveport and administering, administering to the sick and dying. So he, he's kind of ignoring the quarantine. He, he moves from Shreveport throughout the day and he goes and he takes supper at the convent and reports back on the day's news to the, the nuns there, the Daughters of the Cross at St. Vincent's, three miles each day. And uh, he sits down long enough to eat and tell them what's going on. You can only imagine they're asking about the parents of some of the kids that are there at St. Vincent, if they're still around, and um, who's died now and who who's, who's looks to die next. And you can, and there's these accounts of, of them sitting around the, the supper table and just late in the evenings and listening to him recall of the horrific things he sees every day and just how exhausted he was. Um, he's known to work daily until he collapses and he cannot work anymore. Um, and the last time he collapses is actually in the city of Shreveport and he's unable to return as he's wont to do uh, to St. Vincent's again, under his own will. So um, at this point, there are more than six, 900 sick and dying persons in the city. And there are, uh, the number of volunteers are counted in the teams, right? There were six teams to start with. Some of those have passed. Some of those are too sick to carry on. So now people are coming in, hired nurses are being paid from New Orleans to come in and to volunteer positions. And sort of the second and third wave of relief to come as people are just wiped out, uh, dead, or just too exhausted to carry on. Um, and so Lavier sees the writing on the wall, if you will, and like Pierre before him, he starts taking time to write letters, notes, uh, pleas for assistance. And um, he sends them out to Monroe, to Natchitoches, to little pockets of Catholic communities where they might be able to send a priest or a sister or two to help. Um, and here is one that survives. This is his dispatch to Father Gergaud uh, in Monroe. It says, I am all alone with this terrible epidemic. I cannot hold out much longer. Please come to my aid. And it's signed, Lebier Priest. <clears throat> As I mentioned before, Father Lebier actually holds out much longer than he expects. Uh, he's very sick, he's unable to continue his ministries, but he lingers far longer than the rest, and uh, in doing so is able to receive his last sacraments before he does pass. But that brings us to Father Louis Gergard, 40 years old, another Brittany, another Breton of France. Um, he is the founding pastor of St. Matthew's Church in Monroe the first uh, permanently stationed Catholic priest in that city. Uh, he spent 18 years up there building. He's kind of like the Northeast Louisiana version of Father Pierre, I guess. Um, except a major difference, he faced harsh persecution upon his arrival in Monroe for being Catholic, for being a priest, for bringing his popery to that part of the world. Uh, they would frequently spit on him, throw rocks at him on the street. Um, he was not wanted by any stretch. Yet, when it was time for him to depart the city, he had become a rock of the community. And then they chastised him for abandoning them. And um, one of them says, um, you, why are you abandoning us now? And he says, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. So Father, pa Father Gergaud has handed a telegraph from the telegraph from Labier. And according to eyewitnesses, he turns immediately to his associate pastor and says, Write immediately to the bishop and tell him that I go to my death. It is my duty and I must go. This is the priest that didn't wait for the bishop's permission. The bishop probably may not have told him to go. It was expected, there was no reason to not think Monroe was a Riverport town too. Why wouldn't the yellow fever come there next week? Um, this is what the people were telling him when he was getting to, ready to board the stage. Why are you abandoning us? 
it will be here tomorrow. You're leaving us at our time of our darkest hour. And he said it was his duty and he had to go. So um, he turned to the crowd, he addresses them as friends, he bids them farewell. And we know from primary accounts, he turns simply to the coachman, uh, the driver of the stage, and he says, drive on. That's all he says, drive on. So he arrives in Shreveport on September 19th. Uh, the Shreveport he would have seen um, would have looked like a plague-ridden medieval town. So they were burning tar barrels in the streets, producing this terrible, noxious smoke because they believed uh, in something called miasma. Miasma is like a disease of the air, like poisonous vapors. They believed were in the air causing this contagion. And so the smoke, while it smelled, would at least blow away the miasma. But what they were really doing, they didn't realize it, is mosquitoes don't like smoke. So the, the smoke would actually help to a degree of sort of pushing the mosquitoes down the street somewhere else where there wasn't a fire burning. Everything was boarded up. Uh, all the heavy draperies were down. Uh, the only people walking on the streets were the nurses and the physicians and the ministers uh, helping the sick and dying. Uh, you, were, you were absolutely required to stay inside if at all possible. Uh, this is a um, Frank Leslie's Illustrated newspaper. It was a huge newspaper in the 19th century. And um, by the way, when we say this was a bad epidemic, the world especially the United States, was captivated with what was happening in Shreveport. So here's a New York newspaper dispatching a lithographic artist to make sketches of views in town that I'll share with you today. And um, the New York Times itself is obsessed with this. It's on the front page of the New York Times for about two weeks. In fact, only the, only the panic of 1873, when everyone thought they were going to lose all their money, finally pushed the Shreveport epidemic off the front pages. So... Um, here are some contemporary woodcuts, some lithographs. You can see the hearses moving down the street. That's the only traffic on the street. You can see uh, you know, the barrels, I don't know what they are, uh, wagons and things, carts laying there, littered there. Commerce, you remember the picture that, that Dr. White shared with you of the street and all of the wagons and all of the hustle and bustle, it's, it's clearly gone. That's what this image is conveying. You have two hearses, an abandoned commerce, and an empty town. That's what Father Gergard would have seen when he crossed the river to come over here and volunteer to help the sick and dying. So here are a couple other scenes. Here they are on Texas Street, again from that uh, New York newspaper, burning the tar barrels in the streets. Um, telegraph operators, this is itself just a remarkable story. So at that time, telegraph was king. It was the iPhone. It was the way we communicated and um, because of that responsibility, the telegraph operators felt the duty to keep it going. And so they would literally die at their posts, only to be relieved by the next one, which is what you see here. You know, it says, good night, telegraph office, good night. That's his last dispatch, is what it's trying to indicate. And literally, we have six or seven telegraph operators die at their posts, just keeping communications going, keeping the city alive in that way, that, that tangible way, keeping it connected to the rest of the country, letting news out who's dying, who's living, what we need, what provisions we need. Keep in mind, we're under quarantine. No food is coming in. So we're relying on the stores we already had. And then these relief trains from Marshall, Texas come, bringing apples and chickens and bread and things just to keep us alive for food, not even just medicine. But commerce is dead. I mean, there's, no, there's nothing coming in other than relief and priests, really. Uh, the occasional priest. So, um, oh, by the way, the story of this newspaper, I just have to share. When I found out that this was out there, that this was done, I said, well, I've got to get one of those newspapers. So I said, well, let me just look at eBay. So I got on eBay. I Googled, I mean, I, I entered, not Googled, I entered the dates for this newspaper. And lo and behold, there was one available for like five dollars, you know, from Virginia, and I got it. As soon as I became aware of it, I entered it at eBay and I got it. So isn't the isn't the modern world wonderful? <laughs> so um, I just had, I, I meant to bring it. I just moved and I haven't unpacked it yet, but I have it. I, if we ever do a related talk, I'm sure we will. I will bring it so you all can see that. But um, how remarkable 
So that's how I was able to get these nice scans. You can find these online, but they're real pixelated and everything. But I used this really high power scanner so you can see the detail here. So um, Gergaud is able to administer for 10 days, 10 days only, before he collapsed sick with the fever. And um, he himself writes to Bishop Martin in uh, Natchitoches, that time the seat of the diocese, and um, basically asks for help that he, all, he himself knows he won't last much longer either. Help comes in the form of Francois Lavezouet. In his 40s, uh, another native of France, as they all are. He is known, he was well known as an avid scholar, a scientist even, really. He dabbled in the classics, a highly educated man. Um, and his legacy in Natchitoches and Sabine parishes and Rapides is, um, is quite remarkable as well. He was... Uh, very fond of going out into the periphery of uh, St. Francis, which really, Pope, I just can't announce our Pope. Um, pope Francis would certainly love to uh, hear his stories of going out into the, to the, to the backwoods and, and the periphery and ministering to forgotten people. Uh, he would uh, make sacramental common law marriages because there were no priests available out in the Sabine country, the borderlands. And um, by the way, he was a very um, wealthy man growing up in France and could have easily inherited great wealth and position and shunned that and decided to become a priest in Louisiana. Um, and this is where he ends up. So he's coming back from a mission, an eight-day horseback mission in the woods, essentially amongst the people, of Sabine Parish, he rides into Natchitoches, reins up his horse, lo and behold, there standing there is the grim-faced bishop. And he's probably like, oh geez, you know? And so the bishop hands him two letters. And um, one is from the uh, Mary, Mother Mary Hyacinth Lacombe at the Fairfield Convent and Girls Academy, and the other one uh, from Father Gergaud asking him to come that they can't hold out. Um, Mother Mary Hyacinth's letter, I, I won't read word for word to you. In fact, I'll just paraphrase it. Um, but it's really remarkable if you ever get a chance to read it. Maybe one day we'll, we'll print it and give it as a handout or something. But um, she is deeply concerned twofold, uh, and that's clear. First, these are patients, these are sick and dying people, and they need assistance, and everyone is too exhausted or dead already to basically help them. Second, Spiritually, she's concerned the sacraments will end. She does not want the sacraments to end at any point in Shreveport while people are sick and dying. And she says, two of our priests, of course, you know, it takes three or four days for the letter to get to, to Natchitoches. She says, two of our priests are now sick now and they will die in tandem, neither one being able to give the sacraments to the other if no one comes soon. So, um, thankfully, Lebier lasts a little bit longer than, the, than was originally thought. Father Levesoy looks at this, and he looks up and he sees the bishop staring at him, Bishop Auguste Martin, and he says, the bishop says to Father Levesoy, these are recorded, these are their words, this is not me paraphrasing, what would you like to do, my son? Levesoy says, Monsignor, if you tell me to go, I go. If you leave it up to me, I stay. And the bishop wrote that he paused, and he thought for a minute. That wasn't the, the answer he was expecting. He was trying to decipher the real meaning of his words. And finally, Levesoy breaks the silence as the bishop's sort of taking this in. And, and he says, Bishop, I want to go so much that if you, let, you left the decision up to me, I would believe that in going, I'm, I was acting according to my own will. I do not want to do anything but the will of God. The bishop says he can't speak. He's leveled by the piety. And he just tells him, just go. So Levesoy spends the afternoon, keep in mind, he's the two men we're talking about, keep in mind, he's been on horseback for eight days. And uh, he's just getting back into town. I'm sure he's already exhausted. Shreveport and Natchitoches, there's no I-49, okay? So it's going to take him four more days on horseback to get here through backwood traces and terrible conditions that I probably wouldn't last 14 minutes. 
he's going to do it for four days and then minister to the sick and dying. So um, he does take one day to set his will in order. They have mass. It's Sunday. Uh, by the way, I forget now the, the, the feast day, but they wore red. We know it was, it was, a, it was a mass for a martyr. St. Matthew. So they wear red um, during the, the mass. And then he goes. And in a very similar, very similar scenario, a very similar scene, he's leaving town, the beloved priest, and people are telling him, don't go, don't go, it's going to come here next. We, we, won't, we need you here. And he says that he's, he's, he's sorry, y'all, I've got to go. This is beyond me. It's beyond us. So um, he rides up to uh, Shreveport on horseback, which is depicted, I think, beautifully in the um, stained glass windows at Holy Trinity downtown. You have this dark, sullen view of Shreveport. You can see the, the black smoke rising from the street. Holy Trinity steeple there. And you, you can see the vessel depicted racing on horseback. After he's already been on horseback for eight days, now he's got four more days uh, to get here. So, um, he arrives at Shreveport within minutes of Father Garagod's passing. He administers him his last sacraments, viaticum, and um, blesses him, and he, Father Garagod, is no more on earth. And then Levesoe, after all of this, after all of these journeys, now has to really begin work, um, which he does. <coughs> that brings us to uh, the end of his story, which is October 8th. So now the epidemic is, what, about 10 weeks old, give or take? Six, eight, eight to 10 weeks old. And we're looking at probably 1,000 or so gone, um, including the periphery. Not everyone that died was buried in the, the mound. Um, there were family plots, certainly. There were people that died, for instance, in Greenwood or you know, down towards Frierson, those areas that wouldn't be counted among the Shreveport dead, but certainly would have been known to people in town. Um, the Bezalay arrives in uh, Shreveport on September 26th, and he passes on October 8th. So you see he's not able to minister very long before he too collapses and dies. So um, that brings us to the final two and the only survivors of the Catholic clergy during the yellow fever epidemic. And unfortunately, we only have a picture of one, at least to date. Um, this particular priest, Father Dufault, was a Jesuit in New Orleans, and um, he had a long and storied career as a priest. Um, dies in his 80s, I think. And Father Farrick, his, uh, the assistant pastor of St. Louis Cathedral in, uh, in New Orleans, comes with him. Uh, basically, the bishop in Natchitoches has no one else to send. He's lost five priests already. Uh, and, you know, the the numbers of priests today are probably close to what they had back then. In other words, imagine us losing five priests in Shreveport, how stretched we would be. So um, there's no one else to send. And so he, he turns to uh, New Orleans and he says, look, I've got this, I've got my favorite, Le Vesoué, my, my right-hand man, is sick in Shreveport. He's asking for help. He's worried that he will pass. They need to continue the sacraments. They need to continue the ministry. Do you have anyone to send? And they send uh, Dufault and Farrick from New Orleans, arriving at Shreveport. This is a view of downtown. Um, it's supposed to be taken in 1873. I don't know the month. July. July? Okay. So right before it's really understood to be going on. But there's some interesting things going on in Texas Street. I don't know if that's a pile of stuff about to be burned or just junk piled up. I, I, don't, I don't really know. The riverfront's a mess. It really illustrates, um, I think, the sort of sanitation condition of the town at that time. But uh, there's some cool things, like uh, Buffalo hardware, and they're still around, right? Um, and, you know, uh, Sale and Murphy, the Sale family is still prominent in town. Um, so 
Anyway, I just did a good snapshot of what the town looked like at the time to give you some idea. So Defoe and Farrick are here, and they witness the merciful Frost. Frost comes about a month early this year. And early October, the first frost comes. And although they don't understand the disease, they do know that when the frost comes, it goes away. So um, obviously, we know now it kills the mosquitoes, or at least drives them away. So they survive. They're the only ones that survive of the clergy. I can see now that I'm running out of time, and I know Father Peter has some things to say. So I will be quiet and let me turn it over to Father Peter. So um, pretty amazing, these priests and all that, that took place, their heroic virtue, their, um, the whole notion that they're ready to, to give, lay down their life for people whom they know and people whom they don't know. And again, they do it in an unbelievably heroic fashion. So here are people who have come from, from France, which at that point, they would have been in seminary formation for about 12 years. I mean, th that's why these guys are so unbelievably well-educated. They arrive over here, they want to go to the mission territory, and that's what they do. They end up here, and even like that young Father Kemeray, um, 12 years worth of uh, seminary, he gets over here, he's within his first year of being a priest, and all of a sudden he knows he's about to die. And, and that's the purpose for his having spent all of that time in preparation for, for the priesthood. At Holy Trinity right now, you can go there and take a look at, well, you, okay, uh, the, the, there are books there, the registry the, uh, for all the sacraments. We still have that today. So you can look at that, and I've done it, and we, we've scanned every single one of the pages, and you can see so-and-so who was baptized in such and such a date, and who did the baptism, J. Pierre, or I. Kemade. Um, and then all of a sudden, every once in a while, you get a few other priests who are visiting, uh, including uh, uh, Gergaud, who must have come over and went back to Monroe. And um, uh, anyways, all of a sudden, in September, their entries, their entries stop, and then the very next entry is October 29th, and it has Father Dufo. I mean, zero ceremony to anything. It's like, okay, and now the next baptism. Five priests have already died, and later in the registry, they did mark um, uh, very beautifully about the deaths of those particular priests. But they lived with unbelievably great heroic virtue, and we would say even saintly lives. They laid down their life for others. Now, in order to be canonized a saint in the Catholic Church, there are certain things that have to, to take place. First of all, the, the number one way in which a person would be canonized is if they had been killed specifically because of the hatred of the faith. So it, it's not that I am in a battle and I'm helping other people as a chaplain, and we have chaplains, by the way, who have been in battle and they were killed, not specifically killing me as a Catholic priest because they hate the, the faith, but I'm killed because I'm on the, the battlefield at the same time. So, and then the second way is just because of an unbelievably great um, um, uh, sanctity of life, and everyone knows it. So the very first saint to be, um, to be recognized as a saint was uh, Saint Martin, actually. Uh, uh, the first one who was not a martyr, Saint Martin. And... Uh, a soldier, a Roman, who had, who had turned uh, unbelievably saintly. This is even before there was a canonization process. And, and so uh, a third way is when the Pope just says, I declare this person a saint. Just because of everything that has happened in this person's life and subsequent miracles, maybe they... Um, um, maybe they didn't have the type of miracles that were needed for a canonization like St. John Berkman's had, the third miracle being in this state, of course. Um, and 
So actually, Pope Francis has already canonized uh, people who fit those three categories. A martyr, so uh, Oscar Romero, he's about to canonize him in a, a couple of weeks' time with Paul VI. Um, and then uh, Mother Teresa, someone known by the whole world to be unbelievably uh, a saintly person. And then uh, Blessed, uh, um, uh, uh, not Flavor, what was her name? Ah, uh, got it. Uh, a Jesuit priest and uh, who did not have the uh, required miracles, Faber, F-A-B-E-R, um, uh, Peter Faber. Um, and, but nonetheless, he did what Pope Benedict had done before and John Paul II before him, just said, by the power vested in me as a successor of St. Peter, I am hereby declaring that this person, uh, regardless of the fact that they didn't uh, meet all the standards of canonization, is a saint. And so he's already done those. But then last year on July 11th, he issues this particular, it's called a motu proprio, a special apostolic letter, maiorum hoc delixionum, no greater love. No greater love. And in fact, already in the same glass windows at Holy Trinity with the five priests, all the way across the bottom it says, no greater love has one than this than to lay down one's life for one's friends. So the Pope took that from our stained glass. Okay, now, he takes it from John chapter 15. John chapter 15. But I think you can see the link I'm, I'm about to make. So here we have these five priests. They did not die, they weren't killed specifically because of the hatred of the faith. Um, and to date, as far as we know, there's no specific miracle that has been, um, um, through their intercession, has been um, made known to us, certainly not to the Vatican. Again, I would say pray through their intercessions, and we're about to pray through the intercessions because we have these nice holy cards and, and some prayers there. Maybe as Ryan was speaking, you particularly identified with one of them as something that was said. It's like, wow, that, that one was particularly impressive to me. Well, I'll pray through his intercession, especially uh, in times of difficulty, in, in times of, of trouble, in times in which you're like, I just don't see a way out of this. Um, so now, the Pope on this uh, July 11th, last year, just last year, uh, issues this particular uh, document uh, talking about a fourth way in which a person can now be beatified and canonized. And this is a way that even Pope Benedict had spoken about uh, before, and uh, I'll use that quote to close my, my time in just a moment. But uh, this fourth way is a way in which there is someone who has lived a good life, saintly life. Most people would say, wow, he or she is a very good, holy person. And something has happened... Uh, because they have, they have already decided, I am going to dedicate my life to those in my midst, and they dedicate it all the way up to their death. And usually it's a premature death. I mentioned that this whole deal with um, you know, chaplains who have been on the battlefield and, and killed and unbelievably heroic. Well, now it opens up even uh, the possibility of their canonization. And there are two, two priests... Uh, uh, in the United States. One is from Louisiana, uh, that this opens that path to them. So l l let me read from this document. It's a little further down. It's only a two-page document. If you want to go online, vatican.va, uh, click on Apostolic Letters. So uh, the new criteria include a link between the offering of life and premature death. So here, I've already said, I'm, I'm going to lay down my life. I'm going to so dedicate my life to other people, and then something happens that, that brings about that person's death. Number two, exercise, in, at least in an ordinary manner, of the Christian virtues before the offering of life, and then up to death. So, exercise at least in an ordinary manner. You know, th th there doesn't have to be anything of such unbelievable, uh, supernatural... You know, I, 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 don't, I don't have the stigmata. You know, that's pretty supernatural and is a, kind of a pretty clear sign that something is going on in me that is a, 
uh, relates to holiness. Um, so an ordinary man, or, ordinary by the way doesn't mean mediocre. Ordinary, just doing the good things every single day in a, in a beautiful, holy way. That was one of St. John Berkman's uh, keys to his holiness. He put such great love into every little thing that he did. Number three, existence of a reputation for holiness and signs, miracles, at least after death. So, um, it's not that someone just lived a, a mediocre life and then died on the battlefield with this great sense of heroic virtue. No, there, there has to have been a pattern of holiness in the person's life. And then number four, still the necessity of a miracle for beatification. So there still has to be a sense of, by calling upon this person's uh, 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 intercession, that something has happened. God has broken into this natural world in a supernatural way that now this healing that otherwise is inexplicable or some whatever particular event in the life of the person has taken place and, and now we can say, the Vatican say, yes, this is a miracle and this person who fits these other criteria uh, could be considered uh, a candidate for, uh, for sainthood. So we are in the midst of writing this uh, book. It'll be out before too, too long. And, and we're also going to include uh, Pope Francis's document and some of the different things and matching it up to each one of these five priests and, and regarding their holiness of life and how it is that, that we believe that they should be uh, considered a servant of God or venerable or blessed or ultimately a saint. But... Who's to say that someone here isn't the one who's going to be the recipient of that miracle? You know? Well, we've kept their memory alive. Go to St. Joseph's Cemetery. Right around there, you'll see, if you haven't been there, go there. Um, enter all the way in. You take a right. There's a big, huge crucifixion scene with Mary and John at the foot of the cross. And, um, um, and, and you'll see at least memorials to all of them, but uh, several of them are actually uh, buried there. All right, this is what Pope Benedict said. Um, now, you know, Pope Benedict already recognized the fact that, um, that people could uh, live a very holy life and that it did not exclude from the honors of the altar, that's a fancy way of saying, becoming a saint, the honors of the altar, those who had given their lives in an extreme act of charity, such as, for example, by giving assistance to those infected in the spread of a contagious disease, which becomes the cause of certain death. So here, here's already this... Uh, this notion that we are going to uh, continue to, to touch upon in the, uh, with regards to these five priests. Now, thanks to uh, Ryan's beautiful topic, I'm gonna have to close it, my, where is Ryan, there he is. Um, um, I mean, I particularly found it very inspiring to hear about my brother priest, let me put it that way, and, um, and how it is that in this time in which we hear about some priests who have done unbelievably horrible things, there are actually examples, even in our midst, and, and not too distant uh, memory of priests who have, who have done it, who have lived good, holy lives. The, uh, just a little aside, uh, everyone, you've been on Pierre Avenue before? You know who that's named for? Yeah, it's uh, Father Jean-Pierre. The, the city, 145 years ago, uh, realized its indebtedness to it. So it, it's, it was one of the main thoroughfares at the time. And so, um, anyways, and, and there are a few other things like that uh, in the city. Now, what I want to do is take, since it's the 145th anniversary today of St. Jean-Pierre, St. John. Yeah, that sounds great. It just rolls off the, rolls off the, the tongue. Father Jean-Pierre, let, let, let's take his thing, and on the back, and then I'm handing this off to Cheryl because Mass begins in four minutes. Let us pray. Okay. Let us pray together.
Dear Lord, you eased the suffering of your people and comforted them through your priest and servant, Jean. Grant that we may imitate the quality of selfless charity and sacrifice that he exemplified and through the intercession in heaven. See your ongoing 